Hi, everyone. I'm Blair Heckel from the Kurobi Marketing Team. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. With me, I have Irv Lustig, PhD, an optimization principal, and Rob Randall, PhD, senior optimization specialist from Princeton Consultants. Also with me, we have David Bendis, VP of Global Business Technology from Birchbox. And from the Garobi support team, I have Jennifer Locke and Yaromu Nyman. Irv, Rob, and Dave will be presenting the webinar today, while Jennifer and Yaromu will help moderate today's Q&A session. Today, we will be talking about how Birchbox transformed its operations with mathematical optimization to dramatically change the way they run their subscription business. Now, I'd like to introduce you to today's speakers, Irv Lustig, Rob Randall, and Dave Bendis. Irv Lustig, PhD and optimization principal at Princeton Consultants, is a global subject matter in the state-of-the-art optimization and a certified analytics practitioner. Irv is one of the world's top experts in optimization. Irv started his career in academia, where he earned a PhD in operations research at Stanford University. Irv's thesis advisor was George Danzig, the inventor of the Simplex algorithm, who is thus often called the father of linear programming. After years of working to improve foundational solver tools, Irv joined Princeton to work directly with the top industry clients to leverage these tools for maximum speed, reliability, and scalability. We also have Rob Randall, PhD and Senior Optimization Specialist with Princeton Consultants. Rob develops custom production optimization models and decision support systems and helps executives and operations personnel improve asset utilization and increase profit. In addition to building models, Rob is heavily involved in the gathering of requirements and design of surrounding decision support systems. Rob joined Princeton Consultants in 2006 and holds a PhD from Clemson University in industrial engineering with a focus on metaheuristic design and development. And last but certainly not least, we have Dave Bendis. Dave is the VP of Global Business Technology at Birchbox, the easiest way to discover and shop for beauty and grooming products. David leaves the subscription technology and operations, data and business intelligence, and platform product management focusing on creating data-driven experiences and the technologies that power them. Dave is an MBA candidate in the executive program at Columbia Business School and holds a BA from the University of Rochester, where he studied economics, computer science, and music, and was an award-winning Kaufman Entrepreneurial Fellow. David also founded and plays drums for the Birchbox Band. So I will now turn the presentation over to get started. Thank you and welcome Irv, Rob, and Dave. Uh, thank you, Blair. So uh, I'm going to start off by saying a little bit about Princeton Consultants. Uh, Princeton has been in business close to 40 years. Um, you can see our tagline is information technology and management consulting. Um, we specialize in developing advanced analytics applications and deploying them into uh, business usage. Uh, we have applications that are running 24 by 7 based on optimization and other advanced analytics. Uh, we've done over 1,800 successful completed projects in close to 40 years. We're proud to say we're a Garobi premier partner. Uh, you can see a number of our clients there, including Birchbox, as we'll talk about today. Our uh, staff consists of 65 full-time consultants, many with graduate STEM degrees, um, and we have a lot of experience in data science and development. Our senior staff averages over 15 years of experience. Um, so we've been doing this for quite a long time and developing a lot of successful applications. Today, uh, we're going. The, we are. Our title for this is Formulation Matters: Reciprocating Integer Programming for Birchbox Product Assortment. So we're going to talk about a project that Princeton did with Birchbox. Um, we came up with a, an algorithm called uh, the RIP algorithm, or reciprocating integer programming, and we call it Formulation Matters because the key message that we like to deliver is that your formulation of your problem for a MIP solver really makes a difference in being able to get the best performance. Uh, in addition to Rob and I, who did a lot of work on this, uh, this is also joint work with our colleague Patricia Randall um, here at Princeton. So with that, I'm going to turn it over now to Dave, who's going to tell you all about Birchbox. So Birchbox, um, there are all the facts on the page, but what we're really doing is we're trying to help the casual beauty consumer find and discover the products that work for them in their routines. So launched in 2010, so I like to think that we're a startup, but we have the added advantage of 10 years of kind of that wisdom to be able to approach things in different ways. And for us, our kind of black box, the operational thing that kind of powers this, needs to power the customer experience we want to really go 
and deliver. So let's go on to the next slide. We can talk a little bit about kind of the customer experience you want to give and what that black box is. So the experience that Birchbox wants to give to our customers is really kind of governed by how we can actually operate that thing. And in this case, the thing that allows us to build those custom assortments for different people, give them all types of customization and allow them to choose different samples and really build that experience is this black box, so to speak, where we can take our subscriber profiles, where they give us all types of information, their history and their activity, what samples are they liking, what products are they buying, um, what things have they gotten in the past, how do they react to it, um, along with all the different product and vendor attributes that we have, and then use that to figure out the optimal assortment of samples into boxes and then boxes to subscribers. For us, we've been using a MIP uh, model with Garobi to optimize that process. Um, but we started running into a few different things. And when we wanted to innovate on our customer experience, we found that the model was actually a blocker. So it worked for, for us for quite a long time. Again, we've been around for 10 years. We've been working with Princeton for little over a year and a half now, I think, or a little over a year. And it worked, but as our customer base grew and as we really wanted to expand our offering, experiment with different numbers of products in the box, experiment with added customization, experiment and really be able to drive an innovative experience, we put those constraints in and then the runtime of this model increased from hours to multiple days. And when that happens, operations can go up against all types of strange production deadlines, and we really get stuck where we are being forced to battle our operational tooling. And for any type of optimization model, it's really about what is like what does it unlock for the business? And for us, we had some business ideas that we wanted to unlock that our model wasn't really able to handle. So that's when we reached out to Princeton and we wanted to get some time with them and talk about how we could improve the performance of our existing model to really support the innovative experiences we wanted to bring forward. And with that, I'll turn it over to Rob, who can talk a little bit about some of the early formulations, some of the work that Princeton did. Thanks, Dave. Um, Birchbox contacted Princeton to investigate their existing MIP model that they were used solving using Garobi. Princeton offers a third party advanced analytic model review and validation service. With this service, Princeton will meet with your business leaders to understand the problem that needs to be solved then review the existing code to ensure that, that that is the problem that's being solved by the model, and then look for new ways to improve the model. The benchmark the models against best practices in modeling and data management, which gives your business leaders more confidence in the solutions generated. And throughout the process, Princeton will work with your specialists to improve their development skills so they are better equipped to build future models. So now we will discuss um, the simplified problem description um, so we can so that we can talk about the differences between the models. To start, there are products that go into boxes, which are there are roughly a hundred different products that are available each month to go into the box. Each product has a set of attributes associated with it. This includes things like weight, volume, the value to the subscriber, the maximum inventory of that product. For each product, there also may be a minimum inventory that need to go be sent out to the subscribers for this month. Uh, this could exist because inventory is just high or Birchbox knows they're getting more or they, they kind of want to move, move on from it. Um, each month, Birchbox's machine learning algorithms group subscribers into clusters. Uh, this gives the optimization model between 2,000 and 5,000 clusters of subscribers to solve for instead of trying to solve for the full 1 million subscribers. Um, there is an eligibility matrix for each subscriber and product pair. So a subscriber either must receive the product, can receive the product, or must not receive the product. This is an input, in, input to the authorization model based on business rules that Birchbox has in place. The first goal of the model is to create box configurations. To build a configuration, the model takes the available group of products, feeds the potential product set through the constraints to make sure they can be grouped together in a box. Example constraints are things like the range of products in a box must be at least five, but not more than seven. Um, you know, there's a maximum weight and volume of the product you can put in a box. Uh, and then the output is a valid box configuration. 
The next step is to assign the configuration to subscribers. To use a box configuration, it must be assigned to a minimum number of subscribers, uh, but no more than a maximum number of subscribers. Each subscriber must be assigned to a single box configuration by the model. One key component that Birchbox wanted was the ability to quickly identify if it's not possible to um, assign each subscriber a box because of a lack of inventory or because of subscriber eligibility. That, that is one of the pain points with their current model was that it could run for multiple days and then solve, and then they would find out the optimal solution wasn't able to subscribe a configuration to every subscriber, which meant that Birchbox then had to go back, uh, work on figuring out what inventory needed to be added or what eligibility values had to be updated in order to assign all subscribers a box and then rerun the model again. Um, for the configuration, the, the, the best, the goal is to have a small number of configurations as each um, configuration adds to the complexity of the production for the month. Uh, it's typically below 100 and then for the grooming products, uh, it could be as low as 30. Uh, in doing this, the model needs to respect all the products, maximum inventory and subscriber eligibility, uh, which is a key component in the box experience for the subscribers. For the notation, we'll use throughout the rest of the presentation. We will let P be the set of, avail of available products to put in the boxes, S be the set of subscribers that need to have a box assigned to them, and B be the set of box configurations that can be created. We let A be the set of attributes that exist for all products, with mu being the value of attribute A for product P. Uh, an example of obviously is weight or volume of product P. Then let S hat be the set of subscribers that must receive product P. And conversely, let P hat be the product that subscriber S must receive. Uh, similarly, let S tilde be the set of subscribers that must not receive product P. And similarly, uh, let P tilde be the products that subscriber S must not receive. Um, then there's a few set of attributes here we can go through below. Um, the number of subscribers per box, Again, that's across all boxes. The number of allowed box configurations, the number of products allowed per box, um, the total product quantity across all subscribers, and the total, at, total attribute values. That is, across all boxes per attribute, um, like weight of a product. Now, let's discuss uh, the variables that are needed for this initial, for this, uh, initial model. The first set of variables are based on the set of products P. X is an indicator variable if product P is in box configuration B. Q is the number of times product P is used in box configuration B. And Z is a penalty variable if the um, minimum product quantity is not met. The next set of variables are used to determine the box configurations that are used and how many are created. Why is the number, why is the indicator if box configuration B is used by the model? And N is the number of subscribers assigned to box configuration B. The last variable involved has to do with subscribers. W is an indicator variable that determines if subscriber S is assigned to box B in the configuration. Moving on to the um, constraints. We'll start with some constraints that have to do with um, relationship between box and product variables. The first relationship has to do with the number of times a product is used. And the second is um, setting the maximum value for the penalty variable. Um, and it's based on the a maximum allowed product for the maximum value for the product. Um, I think the title bound would be the minimum value for the product, but the, that is what Birchbox is used initially, and it's certainly valid. A product can only be used in a box configuration if that box configuration is used. Um, like the first constraint we have on the page, number of products in a box must be less than the maximum number of the products, number for this product if the box configuration is used. Uh, and the first constraint is super, superfluous, as the last, the next two, the Q and the ones with Q actually. Um, create the same constraints um, via substitution. 
The last two constraints work to ensure that if a box configuration B is made, then it must be no more than the maximum number of subscribers. It must have at least the minimum number of boxes made. Next, we'll talk about some box product quantity constraints. Um, the first at the top you can see is we define the configurations to only index between one and the maximum allowed number of configurations. The first two constraints ensure for each product across all box configurations that the number of products used are within the bounds allowed for that product. If you don't meet the minimum of the number of products, then the Z penalty variable will kick in. The next two constraints set up that for each box, the total products used must be within the bounds for the number of products that can go in a box configuration. And the last constraint, uh, make sure that the model creates at least the minimum number of box configurations. The next set of constraints deal with subscribers. The first two constraints deal with the subscriber eligibility and ensure that those subscribers are either assigned to a box configuration with a product they must have and are not assigned to a box configuration if it includes a product that they cannot be assigned. The next constraint sets the number of boxes to make which is the sum of the subscribers who are assigned to this box. The last constraint says that each subscriber can be assigned to at most one box. Um, the last few constraints here deal with uh, box composition. The first constraint sets up that for each box configuration, all attribute restrictions must be met. The last two constraints set the minimum and maximum number of products that can be put into a box if that box is built. Otherwise, all the product box indicator variables for this box configuration is zero, and obviously no box, no product can be put in the box. Next, we'll look at the objective function for the initial model. It includes several concepts and blends different ideas into it. There are basically um, four parts that get maximized. Uh, the first is an idea of generosity, that for each box we build, the more, the more product we put in the box, the better it is for us, our subscribers. Uh, the second part is to penalize mi missed product minimums, uh, which is a, a very small penalty, but if you look at the next two pieces, um, the third part would be the count the total number of boxes built and divide that by one half. And the fourth part is to count the total number of subscribers assigned to a box and divide it by one half. Um, if you know, notice those last two pieces, basically sum up to the number of subscribers in the model. So the way that it looked that the model objective, we know that if the basically if the sum of the objective function is greater than the number of subscribers, then all subscribers have been all subscribers have a box assigned to them. And there's some issues with this initial model uh, that lead to potential small changes in the input data can cause huge variance in performance. Such as a single unit in the, in the maximum number of products per box will significantly increase the solve times. The blended objective is trying to manage many things, including getting all subscribers a box, meeting product minimums, and providing subscribers with as many products as they can in their boxes. However, the biggest issue with the model is the symmetry in the formulation, and that there's no differentiation between box configurations. Um, since the model is making the decisions about what products go into what boxes, let's say we put products one to five in box one and six to 10 in box two is one solution and products six to 10 in box one and products one to five in box two is another solution. To grow, those are the same solution and having that will cause significant um, performance hits with the MIP. Irv will now um, discuss the solution that we created for Birchbox. All right, thanks, Rob. So what we did uh, is we separated the problem into two parts. One part is to ge generate valid box configurations that satisfy what makes up a, a box, valid box in terms of the products that go in the box. So the way we'll uh, be demonstrating the difference between the old formulation on the new is you'll see things on the left that correspond to the old formulation and things on the right that correspond to the new one. So on the left here, we, well, in, let me start on the right. On the right here, for a valid configuration of box, we just have a single set of X variables indexed by the products that'll be zero or one, indicating whether the product is in the box. For a, a fixed subscriber, 
we can then say that if the subscriber must receive a product, we set the variable equal to one. And if the subscriber must not receive the product, then we set the variable equal to zero. The attribute constraints, instead of being stated over all boxes, are for now a single box X represented by X bar, saying that each one of the attrib attributes, such as weight and volume, uh, must meet their minimum and, uh, and maximum requirements. And then finally, the constraint that corresponded to how many products can go, go into a box, the minimum and maximums as indicated by gamma, is just transferred over without the Y variables. We're then going to have an objective function that is, you'll see that we'll be summing over what we're calling duals in quotes. And the quotes basically are there because these are like dual variables, and we're gonna be maximizing these values in order to find new valid configurations of a box. Now this is a MIP. Every time we solve the MIP, we get a new box and it consists of having corresponding to values of X bar that are set to one or zero, dependent upon whether the product is in the box. This then determines a set P bar, which is are the set of products that are in that specific box configuration. We then add a constraint that prevents that configuration from being generated again. And the way this constraint works is that the first sum represents the products that are in the box, the second pro sum represents the products that are not in the box, and making sure that the sum of those is less than or equal to the number of products in the box less one guarantees we will not regenerate that specific pattern. The idea here is that we're going to solve this MIP multiple times and generate lots and lots of patterns of boxes. And in fact, we can solve it and keep solving it forever or well, uh, until we've generated all possible patterns that satisfy all these constraints to get a complete set of valid box configurations. Recall that the original formulation was limiting us to only trying to find 100 box configurations, for example, that would then be possible to assign to subscribers. So this can give us a set of all valid boxes uh, for that are true for every subscriber. And when we generate it for one subscriber, we can test whether that specific configuration is valid for the other subscribers uh, as well. Now let's, what we're going to do is use the fact that we had all of these boxes and we're going to create a new formulation that is based on the old one. So here's the original formulation that you see here. And now I'm going to do a little animation and create what's called the master problem. So now imagine that these boxes that go across, we have all the possible box configurations. And what we've done is eliminated the X variables from the formulation because we've already determined what their values are as indicated by the red boxes here that indicate which products are in each box. So going down each column in blue, the red markers say these products are in that box and it keeps going all the way across. Uh, the Q variables exist now, but now we only have to generate them not for every, pos every box and product combinations, but only for the boxes, the products for each box, the products that are in that box. So basically the things that are colored in red. And the ZP variables remain there for every product. And the Y variables and the N variables that represent whether a box is actually used or the number of times that box were used also remain as well. We then look at the W variables, which correspond to whether a subscriber is assigned to a box. But now we only create those variables if the subscriber can potentially be assigned to that specific box configuration. So we've reduced the dimensionality, even though there are lots of boxes here, we've reduce the dimensionality of these Q variables and the W variables and the X variables have gone away since they've been pushed into the, that pattern generation problem. So now as this master problem, we're now going to talk about what the constraints look like. And the way to think about this is we're actually not going to generate all the box configurations. We're going to generate a subset of them and solve what will be known as the restricted master problem. So now let's see how the constraints convert. So the first set of constraints were the box product logical constraints, where we're using an indicator to indicate whether we're counting the number of products in the box, but now we no longer need to do that because we know the QPV variables represent whether the product's in the box only if that product was in that configuration. So those constraints disappear, and we still have the error on the slack variables limited by the maximum. Or as Rob mentioned, we could replace that with the minimum as well. 
Uh, the next set of constraints, again, we do not need the X variables, but we can keep the constraint that says if we're going to build that box, that will then determine whether we are allowed to how many products times we're using that product across all in that box. And actually, we can replace the constraint that was uh, based upon whether the product was in the box to equate the number of times a product is used in the box is always going to be equal, equal to the number of subscribers assigned to that box. The next set of constraints remain the same, which basically say that the number of subscribers assigned to the box is limited to about whether we choose to build that specific box. A key thing here is now is that we're now not going to have a limited number of boxes, but instead we're summing over all the eligible boxes, and we have two options. We'll, you'll, we'll talk about this momentarily. The hard option corresponds to whether uh, limiting we have this value tau to the u, which is the maximum number of boxes we want to build. We can add that as a specific constraint. Remember, we have a lot more eligible boxes now, and we want to limit the number that we actually choose. The second set of constraints remain the same, which relate to the product minimums, how many, what's the minimum amount we want to ship. But knowing that that may not be possible, we have the error ZP. And then we're always limited by this maximum amount of inventory on the product. The next set of constraints also remain the same, which indicate saying how many uh, minimum and number of minimum subscribers that have to be assigned to the box and maximums have to be correspond to the uh, product numbers as well. So those constraints haven't changed. And finally, we still have the constraint that says we must build a certain number of box configurations. The set of constraints that were corresponded to subscribers who must receive a product or must not receive a product have disappeared. They moved into the pattern generation subproblem. The next set of constraints remain the same, which equate the number of subscribers that get assigned to a box to the W variables. And finally, the constraint that says that each subscriber is assigned to one box also remains the same. Finally, we change the objective function. As Rob mentioned, in our work with Birchbox, we determined that it was really important to know whether they could get every subscriber assigned to a box, then worry about whether you can do it with the required number of boxes, and then finally worry about figuring out, it, minimizing the error and satisfying the product minimums. So we created a hierarchical objective function. The first objective is to maximize the number of subscribers assigned to a box. The second is to minimize the number of boxes, and this is the soft option. Recall that the hard option would actually have an explicit constraint on this. And the third objective was to minimize <clears throat> the error in reaching the desired minimum product quantities. By using a hierarchical objective function, we can then easily know if we can get the number of subscribers assigned to a box without worrying about hitting the product minimums, um, whereas the original objective was mixing these concepts. So this new formulation, the full master problem has very many possible patterns. We address this by using what are called column generation techniques. We put that in quotes because it's not really true column generation. We generate the patterns as we need them and create what's called a restricted master problem, which will be a limited set of possible box configurations. It's not true column generation because we're not only adding variables, we're also adding new constraints that will be illustrated on the next slide. It's not really, other people might consider using branch and price techniques. The, the challenge with branch and price techniques is that they limit the power of the Garobi MIP solver related to cuts and heuristics and other techniques that make the Garobi MIP solver work well on a wide range of problems. You could think of this more as price and branch. You effectively say, I generate a bunch of patterns, I branch, I solve a MIP, and then I go and generate more patterns. Let's talk a little bit more about why this is column and constraint generation. Each new pattern is generating new variables. We generate variables that correspond to whether pro how many times we'll use the product in a box. We generate the indicator variable, YB and NB corresponding to the number of subscribers assigned to that box, and the corresponding W variables of whether which subscribers are eligible to that box. But in addition, we also add constraints. And this is the complete set of constraints here that are added. There's constraints that are added for every box corresponding to whether the, the box is used and the products and the number of subscribers assigned, the minimum and maximum number of uh, subscribers assigned, whether the boxes are used and the, these totals. So we're not just generating columns, we're also adding additional constraints every time we add a new pattern. 
The reciprocating integer programming or RIP algorithm is basically, we call it that because we have two MIPs that are talking to each other. The first MIP is the restricted master problem and it is generating what we're calling duals. They're kind of like dual variables, which are then passed to the MIP pattern subgeneration subproblem. That generates new patterns, which are passed into the restricted master problem, and we iterate between the two in order to be able to solve the problem. So we're effectively reciprocating information between the two MIPs. To generate the patterns, we solve a MIP. Um, we generate a lot of, there's a bootstrap step where we generate a lot of patterns, making sure we have enough for each subscriber, preferring products with lots of inventory, and then we also use that to generate new patterns as needed. The restricted master problem, we first solve a linear program, the linear programming relaxation, to see can we get every subscriber a box in a fractional way, and then we move to solve that problem as a MIP. The RMP generates duals, in the case of linear programming, they're true doodles, but when we're solving a MIP, we actually create some things that we call duals that allow us to generate additional patterns. So now let's talk about the different steps of the RIP algorithm. The first step is the bootstrap step, where we just want to solve the pattern generation MIP and generate feasible solutions. Our goal is to make sure we generate enough patterns for every subscriber, so subscribers have different choices for which box configurations they can be assigned. And we also wanna make sure that every product has enough patterns so that every product has a chance of being included in the various patterns. One of the things that we do is that as we're solving the, this MIP for more and more patterns and adding the constraint that restricts the patterns from being regenerated, we adjust the objective function. We start off by emphasizing the products that have the most inventory, and then we dynamically adjust to incent the products to be used at the same rate. So what this product count is, is how often has a product been included in all the patterns that we've generated so far? And what we do is, uh, we look at how that compares. So if a product has not been generated a lot, this value is going to be big. Imagine the maximum product count was 10 and the current product has never been used. You'll have 10 times its inventory max, whereas a product that has been used a lot, then this value will be equal to its inventory max. So what this does is it gives us a nice balance between having all the products included and giving us a lot, enough combinatorial diversity for solving the restricted master problem. The second step is the relax step, and this is based on some work that I did with Bob Bixby, one of the founders of Groby, almost 30 years ago, where we solved a large column generation-like problem, and it created the sifting method. Uh, this is in a paper we wrote that's in operations research. Um, the first step that we do is we're going to solve the linear programming relaxation of the restricted master problem. We're going to take advantage of one of Groby's features of concurrent optimization. What that means is that to solve this, we're going to have a horse race between the barrier method, the primal simplex and the dual simplex method. And we can also use the basis from the previous solve to start it and let Groby figure out which method is fastest. After we solve that, we remove, and this is the sifting part, we remove non-basic variables that have negative reduced cost and the associated patterns. And then we add the actual duals from some certain constraints to compute a pi hat, which are the real duals from the linear programming. And we use that to add back previously deleted patterns. But we don't use the true dual variables. We actually make an adjustment to them to create the objective function for the uh, subproblem. In this particular case, that's gonna be pi bar. What happens here is that you end up with a lot of dual variables that are equal to zero. These correspond to products for which the current configuration or set of boxes that have been chosen, we still have remaining inventory on the product. Recall from linear programming theory that if you have a slack variable that's positive, then the dual variable will be zero. So what we do in those cases is we create uh, values by perturbing these values that are zero corresponding to the amount of unused inventory. And what this does is it incents us to pick products that are close to having their inventory constraint almost met and avoids the products that have a lot of remaining inventory, but they still have potential of having some contribution. And then if the pie hat was greater than zero, that corresponds to uh, products for which we have used up all the inventory. And so we put a minus value because we want to disincent using those in the uh, solution. Um, and then we stop this when the master problem objective is equal to our number of subscribers. So at that point, what will happen is we'll have some of the subscribers have a box. They're equal to one, the W variables, but some will be fractional. 
it's then time to move over to the MIP. The first state of the MIP is to take the restricted master problem, but do not include all the variables from the LP relaxation. That tends to make the MIP a little bit too large and harder to solve for Garobi. So our first, the way we do this by populating is by picking patterns first that were in the LP relaxation solution basis or ones that were assigned even fractionally to a subscriber. Then we wanna make sure that for each one of the patterns, box configurations, that we have a sufficient number of subscribers for pattern, but we don't wanna include all the eligible subscribers for each pattern. And then for each product that has a, a minimum requirement, we wanna make sure that there are enough patterns that include that product. And then finally, for every subscriber, we wanna make sure that there are enough patterns per subscriber. So we have a methodology for choosing this so that we get a robust combination to be able to solve the MIP. Again, our overriding goal here is not to make the MIP to have too many variables. We found that being around 300,000 variables or less was good in terms of getting good performance. The next step is the subscribe step. So now we solve the MIP form of the RMP using Garobi, and we stop under three conditions. One condition is that if Groby is able via its cutting planes to prove that we cannot hit that number of subscribers, we can immediately stop. The other one is of course, if we hit that's equal to the number of subscribers, we don't need a proof of optimality. If we, are, if we have 5,000 subscribers, we have the optimal objective value equal to 5,000, we can immediately stop. And then we also decided to only let Groby do a small amount of branching because we felt that if it, typically a lot of progress was not made during the initial branching, if it was great, but if not, it was better to generate additional patterns. If we don't find an adequate solution, either from the first or third conditions, we add back all the deleted patterns that we didn't use in the populate step, and we solve the MIP form of the RMP again. If we still don't have an adequate solution, i.e. hitting the number of, of subscribers that is our target, we then create surrogate dual values. And what these dual values are, if you take a look at them, is that if the slack variable is equal to zero, then the value will be one, but if there is additional slack, it will be smaller. So what this does, since we're maximizing, is in our pattern generation problem, it's going to incent generating patterns that include products that have hit their inventory limit. What we wanna do there is create additional patterns that have keep some of those products, but have additional products that are not being used. Um, and this helps again with the combinatorial diversity for the restricted master problem. Finally, the last steps in the RIP procedure are what we call the boxes and product step. The first step in the boxes step is that we add a constraint that says we must have that number of subscribers. Then we have both the hard option and the soft option. The hard option means that we included the constraint limiting us to the number of boxes we will build. The soft option is basically to say we may have too many boxes, but let's now try to see if we can minimize that and we can stop as soon as the objective is below our target. And once that's true, we add the constraint that was in the hard option that limits the number of boxes that we want to build. And then finally, the product step is to minimize the error of the product minimums. And we stop under one of three conditions. If it's proven optimal, um, we also allow the user to terminate from Birchbox. We print out what are the values that are being violated and they can determine whether those are good enough. And then finally, we also stop after 100 nodes of branching since we typically found that further branching on this problem was not actually producing much better solutions. One of the things that we do is we take advantage of parallel MIP and we have two options of doing that. Um, as you can see on the bottom here, we were using a machine that actually has 32 cores. We use 24 of the cores in our testing. Some of the other cores are used for some other Birchbox processes. Um, and what we, the first option is we use all 24 cores to solve the MIP. The second option is to use Garobi concurrent optimization. And here what we do is we create six parallel solves that are each using four threads, giving each one of those solves a different random seed. And what happens when you do this with Garobi is the different random seeds can change the path and they can help the Garobi heuristics find better solutions. So we tested both of these types of options, the concurrent way, having six parallel solves all solving the same MIP or using all 24 cores just to see which would be better. Now let's talk about the computational results. And there's a lot of numbers in this slide, so let me just uh, help you understand what's here. Uh, on the top, we, we actually tested seven problems as part of our test set. On the top are the, are the results from the concurrent MIP option. On the bottom are from the default MIP using all 24 cores. On the right-hand side in the last column, you can see the times for the problems we used we solved using the old solver. We didn't do it for everything because it was too painful to use all that computational time. But you can see our one of the problems was stopped after 48 hours. That was a time limit. 
Uh, the next one was actually solved in 17 hours. We had a small problem here that was solved in three and a half minutes. We used that to help develop and test our algorithm. What's in green is that's highlighted is in each, up to each point, which is faster, the hard or the soft option. And that's true for then concurrent MIP and the default MIP. And then what's circled in red is what was fastest between concurrent or the default MIP. Now, the other thing that's happening here is we look at how long does it take to finish to get, what is the, the cumulative time to get past each phase? So the linear programming phase for solving the RMP was generally finished in under four minutes. Uh, so, um, the longest here being about four minutes for this one problem. So that means we have a fractional set of assignments of subscribers. Then the MIP phase of getting every subscriber a box was typically solved in under 20 minutes, uh, depending upon which set of options you chose. Then to determine whether it, you can meet the constraint that says you are limiting the number of boxes that you will build, that was determined uh, generally, the hard option was best in that case, uh, but generally under 20 minutes as well. And finally, the total time, which would include minimizing the product minimums, uh, would take a little bit of extra time. But you can see that most of the time we're getting solutions within 20 minutes. And the important thing for Birchbox is that pretty quickly they can determine, even though we had this one hour case here, they can determine uh, pretty quickly, depending upon the hard or soft option chosen, whether every subscriber can get a box. So let's talk about some of the lessons that, that are worth uh, learning from this exercise. One is that formulation matters. While the solvers have gotten faster, we've also seen that business problems are getting harder and the expectations sometimes times be unrealistic. So even with all the great performance improvements that Garobi has had over the last several years, a bad formulation can doom your model and can make somebody decide that optimization and MIP just don't, doesn't work. It's really easy to formulate a model, but it's very, it can be really difficult, and there's an art and a science to make it so that it handles the scale and complexities of different business operations, providing re solutions in a reasonable amount of time, and giving you robust performance over a wide variety of data sets. The second lesson is that it's not always important to get optimality. Um, sometimes it's, you have to understand what are the objectives in the context of the business problem. Sometimes there are multiple objectives that could be conflicting. In our problem, Two of the three objectives were really about whether things were feasible. Can we get every subscriber a box and can we do it in the required number of boxes? And it was important to know that as soon as possible. And then the third objective is about whether we can meet the soft constraint of getting uh, hitting the product minimums. Uh, another, here's Ms. Set of miscellaneous lessons is when you're doing th things like this and developing algorithms, it's important to have a representative data set for continual testing. As you change your model, things might help some data sets and not others. So this is an important thing that we do in our practice is to collect a robust data set to make sure that the changes we work work on in a robust way. It's very similar to the work that Garobi does when they're testing new versions of Garobi. And don't be afraid to challenge the status quo when it comes to the business problem. Sometimes you have to ask why are they doing different things and why things acted that way. And by coming in with a new perspective, you can basically allow the team to consider new angles and think outside the birch box, if you will. And finally, leverage the power of Garobi MIP. The RIP algorithm is based upon solving MIP. In a lot of column generation schemes, people tend to build heuristics to generate new columns and patterns. And we, as you can see from this, MIP does this really quite well. Um, and with the time we spent in the pattern generation problems was really negligible. Make sure to use the various powers and features of Garobi, such as concurrent MIP optimization, uh, the different stopping criteria that you can have. And an important thing for us too was to use the concurrent LP optimization at the root. Um, what we found for our problem is that barrier method was often the winner for solving the root problems, even when we had an advanced basis. Finally, let me turn things back over to Dave, who will make some final comments about the impact this has had for Birchbox. Thanks, sir. So You've heard a lot about the actual formulation, the way that the that printing consultants and Bertrand actually implemented this, but let's get back to the business side of it for one second because this all has to drive some business case, right? We have to be able to, the entire point of this was to build an innovative customer experience to unlock different things where we could go and test new features really quickly, give more customization to our customers. And this has really given us the ability to do that, going from a runtime of multiple days to 15 minutes, um, very personal level, life-changing for me, I used to run this tool over multiple days. And now we can test it, be like, oh, you want to take that, you want to add a sample in. Or if we want to, if something happens with our supply chain, especially with COVID going on right now, if we don't have a sample that we thought we would, 
all of a sudden we can make a new assortment and test that and see what it would take in minutes, maybe an hour if I want to run a few tests instead of multiple days. And the impact that that has on our business is so dramatic. We essentially have four to eight days back that we can focus on having more effective production. We can focus on working with our target vendors and are making more effective product cards that really leverage all the different types of samples as opposed to having to rush this out the door and really be hunting for a solve. We can really test all these different things. We can maximize the amount of customization we give to our customers. Um, we can do a lot with that extra time. And as from a business perspective and from a customer experience perspective, it's been game changing for us. Dave, you also think you said there was some how COVID uh, also, how, how you adjusted yeah. things due to COVID. Yeah, um, mainly because of all of our supply chains. So a lot of supply chains right now are kind of up in the air. Some uh, vendors who are producing samples that might be inside of our boxes, their, produ their production might be slightly delayed, in which case they can't get the samples to us in time to actually put it in, let's say, the June box. If we don't have that sample in the month of May, it's really hard to build it into a June box. So this allows us to say, well, what else can we take? What other samples can we bring in? And instead of being able to answer the question of, well, if this sample doesn't happen, what would work in two days? Um, it's a very different type of environment. And even a working relationship with cross teams as an operational user of these tools to be able to say, give me an hour and I'll test it. Um, so it's actually almost a hedge against uncertainty being able to have something that works in this dramatic of a time increase. All right, and with that, we're going to, I'll turn it back over to the Groby team uh, for the Q&A session. Great, thank you everyone. And thanks Irv, well done on that excellent presentation. I think I might be signing up for a box myself. So thank you for joining us for today. Thanks again, and we'll see you in our next webinar. Take care, bye-bye.